Slides left. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, floating point numbers uh, and how the computer uh, represents uh, numbers like 1.2, for example. Okay, so remember when you're using strings, if you want to test if two strings are equals, always use the equals method, right? Don't use equals equals. Equals equals seems to work uh, until it doesn't. Right? So the correct way to compare strings for equality is equals. Uh, you can use the plus operator. Uh, the plus operator for strings is concatenation, right? So you join two strings, so we know that by now, right? If you, uh, so I have the string James Bond 007. I have another string here made up of joining three strings together, right? In the end, they produce the same string, right? If you want to test if they're equal, again, use equals, right? Don't use equals equals. And you can also concatenate primitive values onto a string. You can actually concatenate anything onto a string, um, and it's guaranteed to work. It may not always give you the string you want, but it's guaranteed to, at least it's guaranteed to work. So for example, here, I, can ha I start out with a string James Bond, and then concatenate a zero, then a zero, then a seven, right? And that zero, zero, and seven, those are all ints. Right? So you can join other types to a string, and everything works fine, but you have to be careful. Oh, sorry, yes, question. Should there be a space? No, so that's the number zero. That's the int zero. That's not a string. Okay, so so there's no, that space isn't, is just for readability. It's not really, it's not an actual space character. Would you put like the James Bond 007? Yeah. Like, oh, you're okay, yeah, you're the, sorry, sorry. Okay. yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, but you have to be careful when you do this because of the way that uh, Java evaluates uh, an expression when it has multiple uh, operators in it, right? So here we have the expression character, right? That's a car plus a car plus a string, right? So you have the plus operator appears twice, right? And now every programming language has to decide what order am I going to do these additions in, right? Um, in Java, Java says it'll do them from left to right if they have equal precedence, right? So it goes left to right, right? And so what does Java see? It sees a car plus a car. Right? And we already know that's going to be an int right, from a previous lecture. Right? So it doesn't actually do string concatenation here. It does integer addition. And that's why you get 201. Right? Converts the character h to its numeric value, converts the a to its numeric value, computes the sum as int. Right? And now we have an int sitting up here. And now you concatenate that with a string. So Java says, oh, OK, now I have to do string concatenation. And we end up with 201. Ha. Huh. So that doesn't work. Uh, the way to fix this is to, there's several ways you can fix it. Right? You can put parentheses in. So I can put a parenthesis here and here right? to force Java to do the character concatenated with a string. Right? So it'll do that first, and then that results in a string concatenated with a car. So that would be fine. The easiest way to fix this problem, if you're doing string concatenation, whoops, sorry. If you're doing string concatenation is at the front just plunk down the empty string, right? So join everything to the empty string, and then everything will be string concatenation, uh, and it'll work just fine. OK, uh, substring lets the programmer get a part of the uh, a substring from a string, right? So it lets you get a contiguous part of a string. There's two versions of the method. So version number one takes in one index, right? So s.substring1 asks the string s for the substring starting at index 1, so starting at the b, going to the end of the string. Right? So it goes all the way, so you get all the remaining characters in the string. Right? If you give it two operands, right, or two indexes, uh, then the second index is interpreted as the stopping index, but substring stops one position before the stop index. Okay? So substring 3, 4 means Give me the substring of s starting at index 3, so 0, 1, 2, 3, right, so that's the d, going up to but not including index 4, right? So in other words, uh, going up to but not including the e, so you just get the d in this case, right? If you pass in the same number, you get the empty string, right? So substring 5, 7 says, give me the substring starting at index 5, so that's the f, 
right? Going up to and including index seven. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So there is no index seven, right? So this stops at index six, so you get the F and the G. Right? Uh, so that second argument is a little funny. It's an index, but it's allowed to be equal to the length of the string, which is not a valid index, right? Because substring always stops at one before that. Um, it's a little bit funny the way that's written. Um, the reason it's written that way uh, is so that if you, want the if you want the part of the string that's in the middle, so I want to get rid of the first and the last character, right? I add one to the starting index and I subtract one from the back index. Right? If I want everything except the first two and last two, I add two to the first index, subtract two, and so on and so on. Right? So it's symmetric on both ends. Oops, sorry. Okay, compare to. Did you guys see string CMP? in your uh, C course, this is exactly the same thing, right? So compare to is the uh, equivalent, uh, it is the equivalent of, of C's uh, string CMP function, right? So it compares two strings in lexico uh, by lexicographical order, right? Dictionary order. Uh, S compared to T returns a negative value if S comes before T in the dictionary, right? It returns zero uh, if the strings are equal, right? And it returns, S compared to T returns a positive value if S comes after T uh, in the dictionary. Right? Compared to, so this is useful that you actually have learned about uh, the equivalent function in C. Because um, it turns out you can put a compare to method in any class that you want to. So if you make your own type um, and you decide you want to compare objects of your type, you can insert a compare to method and then you can, uh, it always works the same way, right? You have the, uh, what is effectively less than, greater than, and equals to for whatever type you want, right? And I'll show you how to do that when we get to that part of the course. Okay, so just some examples, right? So if I compare aardvark and zebra, so S compared to T, right? Aardvark comes before zebra, so the answer is less than zero. Right? If I compare S to itself, well, they're equal, so you get back zero. T compared to S, so that's zebra compared to aardvark. Well, zebra comes after aardvark, so I'm going to get back a positive value. Right. Uh, so compare to turns out to be very useful uh, in computing applications because it's uh, the uh, like because it's the less than it's the equivalent of less than, greater than, and equal to for any user-defined type if the user defines compare to for that type. Uh, you can replace characters or substrings in a string, but it doesn't actually change the string, right? So you have to remember that too. Strings are immutable in Java, so a method like replace doesn't change the original string. It gives you back a new string where the character P is replaced with the character T, right? So if I start with the string sparring with a purple porpoise, right, and I replace all the P's with T's, you end up with starring with a turtle tortoise, right? So you get back the new string that's assigned to the um, variable t. Right? You can also replace strings with a substring. Sorry, you can replace substrings with a replacement string. Right? So if we start off with hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go, and I replace all hi-hos with oh no, right? you end up with oh no, oh no, it's off to work we go. Right? The strings don't have to be the same length. Right? They can be different lengths there. And there's many other methods. One day I'll show you oh, uh, soon. I'll actually click on that link or a link, a similar link, and I'll show you how to read uh, the formal documentation uh, for all of the Java classes that are part of the standard library. Okay, any string questions? The big thing you have to remember with strings are if they're immutable, right? Any method that looks like it changes a string doesn't change the string, it gives you back a new string. Uh, and if you want to test if two strings are equal, use equals, don't use equals equals. Uh, otherwise, I mean, for the, uh, you just have to be familiar with the uh, most commonly used string methods, which is what I showed you in the lecture slides. All right. Uh, don't crash. Oh, thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, just like in C, the types float and double, these are approximations of real numbers in Java, right? Now, 
I told you that float and double and all the primitive types, they occupy a fixed and finite amount of memory, right? And so what does that mean? You can't represent every real number exactly. Right? And so if we look at this a little example here, right, if I take 0.1 and add it to itself twice, right? So 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1, right? Mathematically, that's 0 0.3. If you actually run that line of code and look at the value of EQ, you get back false. 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 is not 0.3, right? Um, which uh, to most people would be surprising. If you don't believe me, we can run a little program right now. Right, so here we've got, uh, can you read that at the back? It's probably a little small. Can you read okay? Okay, so here I've got boop, boop, those three lines of code, right? So I'm gonna take 0.1, add it to itself uh, twice, I'm going to test if x is equal to 0 0.3, and then I'm going to print out the result, right? So when you run the program, oops, sorry. When you, no, don't do that. Okay. When you run the program, right, you print false. Well, sorry, it prints false, right? Uh, so it's 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1 is not 0.3, at least on the computer, right? If you did the same thing in Java, sorry, in C or in Python, you would get the exact same result. Um, so to figure out why this is happening, right, I can use this, there's a class called Big Decimal in Java, right? So Big Decimal is arbitrary precision integer values. Uh, sorry, it, arbitrary precision floating point value, right? That means um, it, is not it does not necessarily use a fixed number of uh, bits to represent a floating point number, right? So if I use Big Decimal to take a value, a double value, Right? I can print it back out to see what is its, to see sort of what is its actual representation on the computer. Right? So when I print out 0 0.1, right, I don't get 0 0.1. Right? I get 0 0.1 point with a bunch of zeros and then a five and then a bunch of other stuff. Right? So 0 0.1 isn't actually 0 0.1. Right? If I do 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1, right, I don't get 0.2. Right, I get 0.2 plus a bunch of zeros and then a one. Right? For 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1, right? 0.3 with a bunch of zeros and then a four. Right? If I do it, if I sum it together three times, I get 0.4 in a bit. If I do it four times, I actually get 0.5 exactly, which is interesting. Right? And if I print out 0.3, so remember this is the sum here, right? Of 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1. If I print out what is the value of 0.3 down here, right, it's actually 0 0.299999999 something, right? um, which is all strange, right, uh, but interesting nonetheless. Okay, so that's that program right there. Now, that output is a little bit misleading, right? So um, when you, sorry, when you go to type in a double number, a uh, double literal, right, if you try to write, uh, a double literal doesn't actually have this many digits of precision, right? So it turns out a double literal has roughly, where to go? Somewhere between 15 and 17 significant digits, right? If you write it out in base 10, right? Now that program prints out much more than 17 digits and the question is why, right? And so what's going on is, right? When I type in the literal 0 0.1, it turns out the computer can't represent that value exactly, right? Because it has to convert that 0.1 to binary, right, base two, right? So when it converts it to base two, it's not exactly 0.1 anymore, right? It's the closest approximation in binary, right? When you print it back out again, it takes your closest approximation to 0.1 and then converts it back to decimal, which is also not 0.1, right? And so it ends up printing out a lot more uh, significant digits than are actually there, right? So in practice, when you're um, working with floating point numbers, if you happen to need very, very high precision, you almost never need that many digits. Uh, you only really have 15 to 17 significant, uh, 15 to 17 significant digits. Okay, so there's a standard called the IEEE 754 standard for floating point arithmetic. There's actually several standards. Most, mo question or no? Yeah. Yes. You mean is there a way to actually get it to represent? Like 
So compute the sum exactly. You mean, is it close enough to 0 0.3? Right. Yes. I would say it's close enough, like right. Two, I was right. So is there a way to do it? The answer is yes, but it's, uh, to do it properly is uh, difficult, and it depends on the context of the problem. It depends on what close enough is for your particular problem. Okay. Yeah. And so if you set like a double value equal to like 0 0.3, yeah. and then like another double value like 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1, yeah. it would still be false. It's still going to be false, yes. So you'd have to write your own method yeah. that does the comparison for you. Yeah. So instead of equals, it'd be something like similar to okay. or something like that. Yeah. Um, but yes, it, that turns out to be context dependent because it really depends on how much, what, does, what is close enough? Like, yeah. what does that mean to you? Yeah. Um, yeah, in a minute, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that. Okay, so, uh, so this standard specifies how floating point numbers should be, uh, how floating point numbers are, um, how they behave and how they're represented on a computer, uh, on a binary computer anyway. Almost every modern CPU uh, that's used for computation, like that's actually like so a desktop CPU or your phone, um, almost all of them follow the, this standard. Right? So there's uh, actually hardware in your CPU that implements the standard. Right? Now, the, all of the details in, of this standard are way beyond the scope of this course. It probably cover two or three PhD level courses, right? Um, what you need to know um, is that every floating point number has the following form, right? So plus or minus some value s, right? So s is an integer value, right? It's called the significant, right? That's multiplied by two raised to some integer exponent, right? And it can be ne the, the exponent can be negative. So s is an integer, e is an integer, right? Uh, and the base is always 2 uh, for our purposes. There's also a standard for 10. So there's also a base 10 standard. Uh, but no computer that I know of implements the base 10 standard. OK, so um, when you do that sum, right, even a number like 0 0.1, if you go back to here, right, the basic definition of how I represent a floating point number, right, you can't represent 0.1. Uh, exactly in floating point, right? It's easy to prove. You just do it by contradict. Do I actually do it? Yes, right? The proof is easy. It's by contradiction, right? So we assume, right, that s times 2e, there's some integer value s, right? There's some integer value e, where when I compute that product and exponent, I get back 0 0.1 exactly, right? Now, to make, uh, t in order for that to be true, e has to be negative in this case. Right? Because that value there is less than 1. Right? And s has to be integer. Right? So obviously, e has to be negative. Right? OK, so how does this work? Right? Well, s times 2e uh, is equal to 0 0.1. Right? I'm going to multiply both sides by 10 to get rid of the decimal point. Right? So I get 10s times 2e, and that's equal to 1. Right? Now I divide both sides by 2e. Right? So I get 10s is equal to 1 over 2e. Now e is negative. Right? So I can bring the 2e to the numerator uh, by negating the exponent. Right? So I get 10s equals 2 to the power minus e. Right? And remember, e is negative. Right? Uh, so that actually becomes positive some number. Right? And now you write out the prime factorization of both sides. Right? So 10 times s is 2 times 5, right? times s. Right? What's the prime factorization of the right-hand side? 2 times 2 times 2, e times. Well, positive, absolute value, e times. Right? Five's prime. These are all prime. Prime factorizations aren't the same. Right? Therefore, it's impossible to represent uh, 0 0.1 exactly uh, using the IEEE standard. Right? There's no five on the right-hand side. Right? So you can't do it. Um, which, again, to most people would be surprising. Right? It's just 0 0.1. How come I can't represent it on my computer? Okay. So float and double. Uh, float is 32-bit. So there's 32 binary digits in a float. Uh, double has 64 binary digits. Now, I don't actually want to write, so when we're studying this sort of thing, I don't want to write down 32 binary digits or 64 binary digits, right? And you don't want to watch me write down 32 binary digits, right? Also, we don't want to work in binary because we're humans. We work in base 10 for the most part, right? And so um, I'm going to switch to base 10, 
and I'm going to use a lot fewer digits. But everything that I talk about uh, carries over to what actually happens in real life. Uh, consider two different decimal. No, I, I don't know why there's two. I'm going to con let's consider the following representation of a floating point binary. Uh, ten, uh, base 10, floating point uh, number. Okay. So I'm going to use four digits only. Right? So four uh, digits between 0 and 9. Right? That's my significant. So I'm going to write the significant with three digits. Right? And I'm going to add the constraint that D1 is never 0. Right? So you never get 0, 0, 1, or 0, 1, 2, or something like that. Right? That number there can't be 0. Right? So there's always three significant digits, three digits there. Right? I'm not going to worry about how we represent plus and minus. We're just going to assume we can do it. Right? Times 10 raised to some exponent. Right? So that's also between 0 and 9. Right? And then I'm going to subtract 5. Right? Now the reason to subtract 5 is because I need to get negative exponents somehow. Right? Uh, and so that trick there is uh, actually used in the standard. Right? You actually subtract what's called the bias from the exponent so that you can get negative exponents. Right? So that means my exponent is between minus 5 and positive 4. Right? And that's going to be my floating point. Uh, that's going to be the representation that I use uh, for the rest of this lecture. Right? Any questions so far? All right. Let's see what happens when we do this. OK, so what is the smallest positive value that I can write down, right? Smallest positive value. Well, that first number has to be a 1, right? Because it can't be 0. If I want the smallest value, that has to be a 0 and that has to be a 0. And that exponent has to be as small as I can make it. So the smallest possible floating point value, uh, smallest positive floating point value is 100 times 10 to the minus 5, right? Or 0 0.001, right? I cannot represent a positive value that's smaller than 0 0.001, right? What's the next largest value? Well, the next largest value, I've only got three digits, right? I don't want to change the exponent because that's going to change the order of magnitude, right? So I have to change that last zero to a one, right? So the next largest value that I can represent is 0 0.0101, right? I can't represent any value between these two. Uh, yeah, I can't represent any value between those two values. Right? It doesn't work. Right? So what's the difference here? Right? So the difference between these two values is, uh, looks like it's 1 times 10 to the minus 5? Yeah, something like that. Right? Not, not negative 5. Right? So any difference between two numbers that's smaller than that, right? I can't represent that. Right? So the spacing between adjacent values when the exponent is minus 5, right, is 10 to the minus 5, right? OK, so now it starts to get weird. What happens when the exponent goes up by 1? So I have 19, uh, sorry, 1, 0, 1, 9, 9 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, sorry, 9, 9, 9 times 10 to the minus 5, right? I add that much to it, I now end up with 1, 0, 0 times 10 to the minus 4, right? So that's what I end up with here. What's the next largest value that I can represent if the exponent's minus 4? Well, it's 1, 0, 1 times 10 to the minus 4, right? What just happened to the spacing between those two numbers? It went up by an order of magnitude, right? So not only can I only represent a finite number of floating point numbers, the distance between floating point numbers changes, right? Here it's 10 to the minus 5. Now it's 10 to the minus 4. Right? So even the spacing between adjacent floating point numbers is not constant. Right? It depends on the order of magnitude. Right? And you can keep on going, right? minus 3, minus 2, and so on. Right? What happens when I get to the upper end? So when I have the largest possible exponent, it's 10 to the 4. Right? Smallest number that has 10 to the 4 as its uh, multiplier is 100 times 10 to the 4, right? which is a million. Yeah, it looks like it's a million. I really should stick commas in. Anyway, right? add one more. Right? The next largest value. Uh, one million ten thousand. So now the spacing between adjacent values is ten thousand. Right? So think about that for a minute. If I take a million, which I can represent in this representation, and if I take one, which I can also represent, right, with this representation, I get one million and one, which I cannot represent in this representation. Right? In fact, I can't represent anything, uh, even ten thousand. Uh, sorry, one million five thousand. 
that doesn't work, right? One million, yeah, that doesn't work. I can't represent that, right? Um, right? And so your, the distance between numbers changes, right? And there's only a finite number of values that you, uh, that you have available to you. Okay, so the distance between adjacent floating point values changes depending on the value of the exponent, right? The distance between pairs of floating point values is called, uh, between adjacent floating point values is something called the ULP, right? Which is short for unit in the last place, right? They just mean, sorry, uh, they just mean that difference here, right? Unit in the last place, that's all it means. Right? I guess technically what they mean is it's here, right? So when you, there's a difference of one in the significand, that's a difference of one ULP. Okay, if you actually want to know how big is an ULP, right, for any given floating point number, you can ask the math class for it, right? So math.ulp, pass it in a floating point number, it will tell you the distance to the next largest floating point value. Right. Okay, absolute error you should know. Uh, absolute error is defined as the absolute value of the true value minus the uh, minus uh, some other value, right? So if you're trying to estimate or approximate or calculate some value, that's x, right? The true value of the thing you're trying to estimate, calculate, um, is x hat, right? And then typically when you compute an error, you typically compute the absolute value, right? Okay, so if I take some real value, right, that fits in the range of a floating point type, like 0 0.1, right? Uh, and I try to represent that with its nearest floating point value, right? Then the standard says the error in the conversion must be no bigger than one half an ulp, right? So that's what the IEEE standard says, right? So in other words, uh, when I write down 0 0.1 and then I store that into a double variable, right? Whatever value gets stored is in wi within half an ulp of, zero, uh, of the true value. Of zero within, so the error between 0.1 and the stored value is one half an ulp, right? If you go back to the picture here, or to the table here, you can figure out why that must be the case, right? So I've got two numbers here, right? It's easier to work with the larger numbers, right? I've got two numbers here, the, dis the spacing between them is uh, 10,000, right? If I write down any floating point number, any real number between those two values, right? I can always, I have a choice between two different representations, right? I can pick that one, right? Or I can pick that one, right? Uh, so if I pick, for example, you asked me for one, if you wrote down the number 1,005,000, right? That's the largest possible error, right? I'm within, uh, I'm within 5,000 of that value and I'm within 5,000 of that value, right? Anything smaller than 1,005,000, I'm closer to this value, right? Anything bigger than 1,005,000, I'm closer to this value, right? And so uh, you can always get to within half an ulp, right? By choosing the value that's closer, uh, by choosing the value that you can actually represent that's closer to the one that you want to represent. All right, any questions so far? Because this is all a little strange the first time you see it. Okay, good. I have a theory that it's slightly easier for the engineering students compared to the computing science students. Okay, so what if I want to compute errors and I want to express them in ULPs, right? Okay, so to compute an error in ULPs, the way this works is you write the true value uh, as a floating point value, right? So in other words, you take your true value, you convert it to the representation that you're using, right? If the true value has more digits than your representation, you just write down all the digits, right? So you don't worry about that. Okay, then you take your, uh, your value x, right? So that's your estimated, calculated, whatever, measured value, right? And then you write it down using your floating point representation, right? Now, when you write it down, you make sure that the exponent of x, right? The, the, the exponent in the representation is the same as the exponent that you wrote down for x hat, right? Now, you just subtract the two values and take their absolute value, right? So, for example... If my true value is 1.29 and my estimated, calculated, measured value, right, is 1.25, right, then how do you compute this? Well, I write down 1.29 using my representation, 
Right? So in other words, I write down 1.29 with my three-digit significant. Right? So 129. Right? What's the exponent? Well, you just compute the exponent, right? So it has to be 10 to the minus 2. Right? Now I write down 1.25, right? Also using my representation, but keeping the exponent the same as for x hat. Right? So in this case, you get 125 times 10 to the minus 2. Right? So remember that exponent here, right? has to be the same. So this exponent here must be the same as this exponent here. That might mean you have fewer digits here, or more digits, I suppose, um, in the value on the right-hand side. Right? Now compute the difference. Right? So that's 4 times 10 to the minus 2, right? which is 4 ulps. Right? Because the exponent, on the, the exponent here is to the minus 2. Right? So you're only interested in uh, the integer part here. Right? So that's 4 ulps. Here's another example. Right, so I've got 12.1, so I write that out with my representation. So that's 1, 2, 1, right? three digit significant. Right? Compute the exponent, so minus 1. Right? Write down 0.5, also using a three digit significant, but your exponent must be the same uh, as the, uh, sorry, using an integer value here, it may not necessarily have three digits. Right? And then Make sure, sorry, make sure that exponent there is the same as that exponent there. Right? So now you get 5 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? Compute the difference. That's 116. Right? So that's 116 ulp error between those two values. OK, any questions so far? All right. Now, sometimes that true value is a real number as opposed to a floating point value. Right? So maybe your true value is pi, and you're trying to write down some algorithm that computes pi. Right? Pi has an infinite number of digits, uh, digits, right? So if your true value has lots of digits in it, you don't care. You just write it down using your representation, right? So three digits in the significant, right? Then you just write down the rest of the digits with a decimal point, right? Compute the exponent that you need, assuming you're using three digits uh, in, uh, before the decimal point, right? So 59,287 becomes something times 10 to the 2. Now take that number, write it down uh, using the same exponent, right? Do the, do the difference, uh, and you end up with, uh, in this case, 3.875603 ohms, right? OK, well, relative error is simply the absolute error divided by the true value, right? So if someone asks you for the relative error, uh, then you, uh, you don't do it the way I showed you, right? You just use real arithmetic to actually compute the relative error. That's all I'm going to say about relative error for the time being. OK. So if I have two floating point numbers and I want to add or subtract them, uh, how does that work? So if they have the same exponent, right, then uh, so when you take your floating point number and you convert it to your representation, if they have the same exponent, right, then it's easy to add them together. Right? So 12.1 and 63.8. Right, so what's 12.1 in our representation? 121 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? What's 63.8? 638 times 10 to the minus 1. What's their sum? Easy. Right? Just add up all the digits, you get 759 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? Same thing in the second example. Right? It becomes 815 plus 136 right? times 10 to the 2. Right? Compute the sum, 951 times 10 to the 2. OK, now what happens when your result produces an extra digit? Right? So when I take two numbers, sum them together, and I can't represent the sum with three digits anymore. Right? Then you write the result using the extra digit. Right? So you compute the result. So here we've got 82.1 and 63.8. Right? That becomes 821 and 638. Right? Compute their sum. So that's 1459. Right? So that's your intermediate result. Right? It's intermediate because uh, the result, to hold the result, you actually need four digits. Our representation only has three. Right? Uh, and now you have to decide, how do I handle that fourth digit? Right? So for our purposes, we're just going to round. Um, you might choose to throw it away as well. Right? So if you threw it away, you would get 145 times 10 to the minus 1. Sorry, 1450 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? 
If you round, then you get 1, 4, 6, 0 times 10 to the minus 1, right? And now you adjust the exponent sorry, so that you have three digits in the uh, significand. Right? Similarly down here, when I add uh, those two values there, it's 815 and 936. Right? Compute their sum, 1751 times 10 to the 2. Right? Only have three digits significant, so that becomes 175.1 times 10 to the 2. Right? If I round now to the nearest integer, it's 175 times 10 to the 3. Right? I guess back here, the way to think about it is this is 145.9 times 10 to the times 10 to the 0 right now round to get 146 notice that even though you can represent the two operands right you can't re uh, exactly you can't represent the sum exactly right the true sum is 1459 145.9 uh, times 10 to the 0 right but we can't represent that Right, so your sum has error in it. Right. Uh, now, if they have different exponents, you have, a, you have another problem. Right? So if you have operands with different exponents, then the operand with the smaller exponent, you scale its significant so that the exponents are equal. Okay? So here I've got 4 million, and here I've got 12.1. Right? So what's 4 million? Well, it's 432 times 10 to the 4. Right. Okay, now 12.1, I'm supposed to write this thing down with our floating point representation, right? Uh, so that would be, and I'm supposed to try to make the exponent the same, right? But I can't, obviously I can't do that, right? And so you default to make the exponent the same, right? And then write out all of the digits, scaling the number appropriately, right? So y becomes 0.00, .00 uh, sorry, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.000121 times 10 to the 4. Now compute the result. So sum all the digits. Right? 432.00121. Right? Round to the nearest integer, you get 432 times 10 to the 4. Right? So what did we just do? I took a positive value plus a positive value. So I got x plus y is equal to x. Right? Which happens on the computer. Right, you can have two floating point numbers, x and y. You can compute their sum, and you end up with uh, x, even though y is not 0. Right? So the rules of floating point arithmetic do not follow the rules of math. Right? I can sum two positive values and get back a value that's equal to one of the two positive values. Right? Uh, notice that in that calculation there, I actually need eight digits to compute the correct result. I only have three, so that's where the problem lies. Right? I, I, uh, I don't have those extra five digits to actually compute the value. Sorry, to actually store the value. All right, so that begs the question, right? Well, if I need extra digits, can't I just put extra digits in my CPU? Right? Maybe. So on a modern CPU, the answer is yes. Right? You can, in fact, insert extra binary digits. Uh, so I think on an Intel computer, um, even though a double is 64 bits, uh, I believe uh, they actually use 80 bits internally. Right? So you can actually insert extra bits. Right? But back in the day, uh, when we were first making integrated circuits, right, uh, it was very expensive. Like every bit that you add is enormously expensive. Right? So back in the day, if you were summing two 8-bit numbers, you had eight bits to do it in, right? So you couldn't always insert extra digits, right? All right, so imagine we're back, I don't know, 50 years, right, roughly, right? Um, you don't have extra digits, so what do you do? You throw away the digits, right? Anything that's extra that you can't hold, you just toss away, right? So when I do that same sum all over again, right, when I write 12.1 with the exponent 4, I just toss everything after the, after the decimal point, right? And so now you get 432 plus 0, which is 432, right? Yes? Is there something special about the number of digits in each or is that You mean the three digits? Yeah. No, there's nothing special. It's just so that I don't have to write down a very large number of digits. Okay. Yeah. This works. It doesn't matter how many digits, right? If it's finite, you always run into this problem.
What time is it? Sorry. Okay. Okay, now, if you uh, don't use extra digits, right, then addition and subtraction produces, can produce enormous errors, right? So here's 10.5 minus 9.98, right? The distance between those two numbers is not big, right? It's only point, uh, what is it? It's point, uh, what is it, 5.7? Something like that, right? It's only 0.57, right? So let's go ahead and do the subtraction, right? So I got 10.5, so that's 105 times 10 to the minus 1. Uh, 9.98. Now I have to write that using 10 to the minus 1. Right? No extra digits. So when I write that out, I get 099.8. Toss the point 0.8. Right? And I'm left with 0 0.99. Right? Now do the difference, and you get 6 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? Okay. Now scale that back up. Right? So I'm going to scale that back up to the, so that I'm writing it down in the proper uh, floating point format. Right? So that's 600 times 10 to the minus 3. Right? If you actually compute this difference, right, the true value is 520 times 10 to the minus 3. Right? Compared to the computed value of 600 times 10 to the minus 3, right, that difference is 80 ulps. So there's 80 ulps of error in that calculation. Right? What does the IEEE standard say? It says when you sum or subtract two values, or multiply or divide, uh, the error must be within one half an ulp for every basic arithmetic operation. Okay. So we're nowhere near one half an ulp, right? We're 80 ulps away. 160 times too big in error. Uh, so this isn't going to work, right? We can't uh, actually follow the IEEE standard here uh, if I don't have any extra digits. Okay, so. As soon as you insert one or more extra digits, those digits are called guard digits, right? Your modern CPU does have some guard digits, right? I'm just going to use one. So if I just insert one digit, right? So I got, I'm allowed to, use, for the calculation, I'm allowed to carry one extra digit, right? And then convert it back to a three-digit significant, right? So 10.5 is a 105, one extra digit, so 0 0.0, right? Times 10 to the minus 1. 9.98 is 99.8. I'm allowed to keep the 0.8 now, times 10 to the minus 1. When I compute the intermediate result, right, I'm allowed to keep that digit, so it's 5.2 times 10 to the minus 1, which is 520 times 10 to the minus 3, right, which matches the true result, which is awesome, right? So now I'm definitely within half an ulpla error, right, because I actually got the correct result. Okay, so it turns out a single guard digit is, sorry, were you taking notes? I don't know. Am I going too fast? Am I okay? Okay. It turns out that one guard digit is not sufficient to ensure a half ulp error, but two guard digits uh, does work for this particular um, example, for this particular representation. Right? So with one guard digit, if I subtract those two values, right, you end up with 101.5 times 10 to the 0. Right? I convert that to a three-digit significant and round, so I get 102 times 10 to the 0, right? The true result is 101.41, right? If you actually do the, uh, if you actually compute the true mathematical difference, right? And that's 0.59 ulps of error, right? So you don't quite get there uh, with, uh, with a single digit, right? But two is uh, you can prove that it's uh, guaranteed to get you there. Okay. Something funny happens when you subtract values. So when you subtract two floating point values, uh, you end up with a phenomenon called cancellation or loss of significance. Right? So I'm going to, for this slide, I'm going to switch to 10 significant digits. Right? Or 10 digit significant, sorry. So I'm going to subtract two values. They're only they only differ by one. Right? So they're, they're, uh, one ends in 89, the other ends in 90. So when I subtract those, I get 1 times 10 to the 0, right? So that difference, right, those two digits, they have 10 significant digits in them, right? All 10 are, well, I guess you can argue the first one, that 0 is not significant, right? So there's 9. But anyway, you have roughly 10 significant, digit, 10 significant digits. When you do the difference, you end up with one significant digit, right? It's 1 times 10 to the minus 9, right? So the difference only has one digit, one significant digit, whereas uh, both operands have 10, well, 9 and 10, right? 
Um, but that's just the way subtraction works, right? That shouldn't really be surprising, right? You subtract two values, then yeah, the result, uh, or you subtract two positive values, and yeah, the result is smaller than, uh, is gonna be smaller than one of the two numbers at least, right? Okay, so this is called cancellation because the leftmost digits, right? So all of these digits here, right, which used to have a value that wasn't zero, right? Those all become zero, right? And the digits on the left side of the number, right, those are the ones that contribute most to the magnitude of the number, right? So these are the digits over on the left-hand side. That's called the most significant digit. The digit on the right, least significant digit because it contributes least to the magnitude of the number, right? So when you subtract two values, you lose the most significant digits, right? Now, if the two operands contain no error, then this is just the way subtraction works, right? So yeah, you get cancellation, but it doesn't matter, right? Because that's how the subtraction is defined, right? So we call that benign cancellation. Okay, so let's stop there. So I don't want to get, so there's a phenomenon called catastrophic cancellation that occurs when you take two values, you subtract two values, but one or both of the values have error in them, right? And we've already seen that error creeps in very easily when you do floating point uh, calculations. So we'll look at that phenomenon in the next lecture.